praise in the words of Psalm 30. Psalm 30, and we're going to sing the first four stanzas. We see the psalm as a title, a psalm, a song, at the dedication of the house of David. Lord, I will thee extol, for thou hast lifted me on high, and over me thou to rejoice, madest not mine enemy. O thou who art the Lord my God, I in distress to thee, with loud cries lifted up my voice, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, my soul, thou hast brought up and rescued from the grave, that I to pit should not go down alive, thou didst me save. O ye that are his holy ones, sing praise unto the Lord, and give unto him thanks when ye his holiness record. For but a moment lasts his wrath, life in his favor lies, weeping may for a night endure at morn doth joy arise. In my prosperity I said that nothing shall me move. O Lord, thou hast my mountain made to stand strong by thy love. But when that thou, O gracious God, didst hide thy face from me, then quickly was my prosperous state turned into misery. Wherefore unto the Lord my cry I caused to ascend, my humble supplication. I to the Lord to, to I to the Lord it send. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to pit? Shall unto thee the dust give praise? My truth declare shall it and so on. Singing just now verses one to four, Psalm thirty. Lord, I will be extol. Lord. I
Can we unite together in prayer? Let us pray. O oh Lord, our gracious God, we echo the words that we have just sung. Lord, I will be extolled. Give us grace this morning to do just that, to extol the Lord, and to have our minds, our focus, taken away from ourselves and from all that might distract us, so that we are focused wholly for the hour we are here on the things of the soul. For the things of this world, they hold our attention six days of the week and most of the seventh. But we pray that even for a little time, the things that are unseen but that are eternal would be before our minds and on our hearts. And that we would find ourselves led into worship, not just formally, but deep in our hearts, deep in our souls, that we would feel the Holy Spirit drawing near, and that we would have a sense that we are engaged here in something that is supernatural, something that is holy and high and sacred and totally different. We pray, Lord, that we might find as we come hearts that are humble, souls that are expectant, yes, indeed, hungry for the word of God, Hungry to hear a word, hungry to hear a word for ourselves. We come, eternal Lord, and we pray that all that we do would be to thine own glory. We pray for each one of us, our homes and our families. We pray for any who are unwell in our midst, and we see some empty places and we do pray that those who are unable to be out, whatever uh, uh, they might uh, have detaining them, uh, that it might prove temporary, and that uh, they might be back again in their accustomed place. We pray, Lord, for those whose concerns are more long-term and deep-seated, those awaiting surgery, those who have been in hospital, we Commit them in a particular way to thyself. And as we pray for those amongst ourselves who are unwell, we pray for the wider community around us here. We pray for those who mourn as well. This week has seen its own share of that in our midst. We pray thy blessing, Lord, upon the gospel. It goes out today from the east the furthest reaches of the east, and it goes across to the west, across Asia, across Africa, Latin America. Oh, we pray for all who preach Christ crucified, and to present the simplicity and the glory of the gospel, that sin has ruined us, and alienated us from God, but that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, that that word would go out, and that those who have already embraced Christ will find their hearts filled with gladness and joy and encouragement, and that those who know that they have not will be drawn with the irresistible drawing of the Spirit, so that they too will come and bow the knee and bow the knees of their heart. 
and submit themselves to the King of Kings and find in his favor pardon of sin, peace of conscience, and life, eternal life. Make us, Lord, a people who are serious, serious about serious things. Make us a people who are given to prayer, who turn to the Lord, not merely in our moments of distress, and then forget and abandon it all, but that we would be those who would be in prayer, with prayerful hearts, that we would be committing our way to the Lord, that prayer would be uh, the very breath of our soul, that we would be those who would walk close with the Lord and in his way. We pray for our denomination. We give thanks for thy kindness toward us. Remember each congregation, whether here in our own country or in other parts of the world, we think of our friends in Sri Lanka. We pray that in the midst of the difficulties with COVID, that they might be kept and sustained and that the gospel would be blessed. And we are thankful, Lord, for the very evident blessing that has been on that work since it began. A little one is becoming stronger. And uh, we have seen many people brought to saving knowledge of Christ. We have seen people come for baptism. We have seen people come and seek admission to the Lord's table. We have seen people evidently professing Christ, transformed by the power of his spirit. Oh, we pray that there would be more of that and that that work that has begun there would yet flourish and grow more and more to the blessing of that land. We think of those in France and Spain. We are thankful for encouragements there too and not least the ordination. Yea, we trust in due time in France and the setting apart to office. Raise up others there who would be office bearers, those who would be deacons and elders. And as we look ahead eventually to seeing a, a presbytery established there, that thou, Lord, would provide near the manpower and the wherewithal. We pray for our friends in the presbytery of the United States. Remember them, Lord, and be gracious toward them. We pray, Lord, for those beyond our horizons and our borders. We pray for all who bring the good news of Christ. We think of thine ancient people. And all our hearts are heavy for them. Our hearts are heavy for them. We, we receive their heritage and we love their heritage. And we long for the day when they will love their heritage. We long for the day when they will see that their Messiah has come. We long for the day when they will see in the New Testament the fulfillment of their old. Bless, Lord, those who minister to them. And forgive us for how often we forget them and overlook them. Bless the gospel throughout the Middle East. We think of the Middle East Reformed Fellowship and many other organizations like it. We think of those engaged in chaplaincies, those engaged in Christian unions and colleges and universities and scripture unions and schools. Lord, bless all of these endeavors. And we pray for our young people. We are thankful that today we have taken a step back towards a, what we might call normality as at least some of the Sabbath school are able to gather again in the hall. It has been a long year, Lord, and we are thankful to have reached this stage and to be able to take our first steps in that direction today. Bless them, Lord, as they gather there. And remember us all now, we pray. Cover our sin. Give us hearts that are conscious, consciences that are tender. And hearts that truly forsake sin and turn from. It, and seek cleansing and new hearts. We pray for those who govern us. The word of God tells us to pray for them. We don't know if they pray for themselves. We believe some of them do. But we pray for them all. We pray that they would be guided and that they would guide the nation through these weeks of emergence from lockdown. We pray, Lord, that we might not see regression in this, but that indeed we might see progress, that we might see spiritual progress. We long for that. 
We have prayed for a year that the Lord would bless COVID-19 to this nation. Bless COVID-19 to the nations of the world. Ah, we continue to pray. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Who before us now and remember us all, from the little infant in the crash to those that are perhaps more advanced in years, our needs are the same. Christ Himself and all that He can bring into our souls and lives. Go before us now, cleanse us, lead us, guide us, guard us. Assist us as we handle the word. And all we ask, in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Can we read together now in the scriptures of the New Testament and in the epistle of James? The epistle of James... And we're going to read towards the end of chapter 4 and reading on into the first part of chapter 5. James chapter 4, reading at verse 10. James chapter 4, reading at verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver, who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live, and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were pile. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which of you which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ear, ears of the Lord of Sabor. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren. To the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, till he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye also a patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. 
You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not in the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. We trust the Lord to follow with his own blessing that reading of his own holy and inerrant word of truth. We're going to sing again now to God's praise in the words of Psalm um, 71. Psalm 71 and at verse 14. Stephen, if you would lead the singing, Psalm 71 and at 14. But I, with expectation, will hope continually, and yet with praises more and more, I will thee magnify. Thy justice and salvation, my mouth abroad shall show, even all the day, for I thereof the numbers do not know. And I will constantly go on in strength of God the Lord and thine own righteousness, even thine alone I will record. For even from my youth, O God, by thee I have been taught, and hitherto I have declared the wonders thou hast wrought. And now, Lord, leave me not when I old and grey-headed grow, till to this age thy strength and power to all to come I show. And thy most perfect righteousness, O Lord, is very high, who hast so great things done, O God, who is like unto thee. Thou, Lord, who great adversities and sore to me did show, shalt quicken and bring me again from depths of earth below. My greatness and my power thou wilt increase and far extend on every side against all grief. Thou wilt me comfort send. Singing just now from verse 14, Psalm 71, 14 through 19, six stanzas. But I with expectation.
Before we turn to the word, can we unite again in prayer? Let us pray. Eternal Lord, as we gather together now around the word, we pray thy blessing upon us in the power of the Spirit. We pray for those who have just joined us from the Sabbath school, how thankful we are to see them coming in again and taking their accustomed place. We pray, Lord, that they might be blessed in their own souls and all that they have learned already today, that it might linger in their souls. And as they join us, grant, Lord, that they would not be in any way distracted themselves having just come in, but that they would feel as though they had been here indeed from the commencement of worship. We pray thy blessing then upon us, and we crave the power of the Spirit. We can do nothing without it, and we are conscious that we grieve the Holy Spirit and that we quench the Holy Spirit, and we are not surprised that we do not find it in our gathering. But our Lord, we pray that thou wouldst come and visit us, even today. Hear our prayer and continue with us, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Can we turn again now to God's word and to the New Testament scriptures, but not to the passage we read, but to another passage the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians in chapter 7. One Corinthians in chapter 7. And my interest particularly today is in verse 31, but just to preserve the context, we'll read from verse 29. One Corinthians chapter 7, reading at verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that are wise be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, and particularly the next phrase, for the passion of this world passes away. The passion of this world passeth away. Now God's providence is so mysterious. What I'm about to say just now, I had fully prepared, of course, for last Lord's Day. And I had done so in the light of the death and the funeral the previous day of Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. I, of course, took on well, and my mouth was silent last Lord's Day. But although a week has passed, I resolved that I was going to return to this passage. Nevertheless, for some reason, I was not to preach on it last Lord's Day, but today. And although a week has passed, the passing of Prince Philip, is still fresh in our minds. And it was an event that marked uh, an end of an important chapter in our national life. For the past 70 odd years, he has been a public figure, something of a constant actually in the midst of change. Now in this particular chapter, we have the apostle dealing as you can see for yourselves, primarily with marriage and a whole matter of issues and details are set out here, which I'm not going to enter into this morning. Because my interest is in the phrase that we just read, the fashion of this world passes away. And to look at this phrase and its context in the light of the death of Prince Philip. The fashion of this world passes away. Now fashion here doesn't just mean what's fashionable, although it includes that, 
The Greek term that's used here is much broader than that. It means the ways, the practices, the principles, the very substance of this world. None of it is very solid or enduring. Now, there are four things I want to highlight about this phrase, and I shall spend most of my time on the fourth. I want us to notice, first of all, that it's telling us something we know. It's telling us something we know. The world and its fashion passes away. We know that very well. Change and decay in all around we see. It's a rare week, friends, that doesn't bring change into our lives to some extent, even little small changes. And it's a very rare year that doesn't bring major change into our lives and into our experiences not least through death. We see it, we experience it again and again, that this world and its fashion passes away. It's all exceeding temporary, frail and uncertain. No matter how long we may live. Now the Duke of Edinburgh lived for 99 years. And those of you who are the younger end here, 99 years, I know it seems to you like 10 lifetimes. But 99 years comes and goes. And so would uh, 999 years. I knew an old lady who died just a few weeks ago. And she was a relative of ours and she was way over the hundred. I think maybe 105, 106, I can't remember just now. But she would tell me that they went in the blink of an eye. We're not here forever. We're not here even very long. No matter how long we live, it goes quickly. And no matter how high we climb the social ladder to find fame and success, it's all very temporary. And at the best, it's fleeting. You might, like the Duke of Edinburgh, marry a princess or a prince. But supposing you did, or became some major celebrity that everybody knew and you were photographed everywhere you went. It's very temporary because the world and its fashion passes away. As we're going to sing later in Psalm 103, the wind passes over it and it is gone. And the place where it was knows it no more. So this is telling us something we know, but then secondly, it's telling us something we forget. It's telling us something we forget. As we think ahead, as we plan ahead, it's true, isn't it, that we forget all of this. We overlook this fact that everything here is temporary and exceedingly uncertain. Now, you remember the passage that we read in the epistle of James. James made reference there to that group of businessmen who were planning. You'll find it in verse 13 of chapter 4. They're planning that they're going to go into this city and there they're going to buy and sell and make gain and they're going to stay there about a year, they say. Now, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with forward planning. But they forgot that the world and its passion passes away. And James himself has a, a, a warning, a correction for them, doesn't he? In verse um, 25 that we read. Whereas they ought to have said, um, uh, verse 15 rather, they ought to have said, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this 
or that. They forgot how temporary and uncertain everything was. And then there's that man in the parable that the Lord tells us of, who was building and planning at least a big extension. Now, there's nothing wrong with big extensions. But he completely forgot that the world and its passions passes away. He invested everything he had in this world. And that very night, he was summoned into eternity. Whatever we overlook, whatever we forget, whatever we neglect, the word of God warns us again and again not to overlook, forget, neglect this fact. Lest eternity find us as unprepared as the man in the parable. It tells us something we know. It tells us something we forget. Thirdly, it tells us something we avoid. It tells us something we avoid. Sometimes we forget all of this. In the, in the run, in the rush of life. But sometimes, oftentimes, we deliberately forget it. Or at least we do our best to ignore it. And you may be very conscious at this very moment that that is true of you. Sometimes. More than sometimes, I don't know. That we avoid and try to avoid thinking about this. Our own humanity. And the fragility of our humanity. And the thin thread. That sustains us. Well that's the very point. That is being addressed in the passage here. By the apostle. And I'll, we'll see that in a moment. So it tells us something we know. It tells us something we sometimes forget. It tells us something we sometimes avoid. Fourthly, it's telling us something we need to apply. It's telling us something we need to apply. This world and its passion is passing away. Something we mustn't forget. Something we shouldn't avoid. To forget it is foolishness. To avoid it is madness. Well, as I said in this passage, the apostle applies this very point. And he does so from several different angles. And I'm going to look at just four of these particular angles. There are more, perhaps but we'll limit ourselves to four. He applies it, first of all, to our relationships. Verse 29. This I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth as though they, are they that are wise be as though they had none. Now, it's applied there particularly to one relationship, but what it says to one relationship, it's in many ways applying to others as well. Now, obviously, it's not suggesting that uh, uh, the husband is to be unkind or anything like that. That's not what the word of God here is saying. But it is reminding us that this relationship and every relationship we have in this world is temporary. That it belongs to this world. And that the family routines that we have, they belong to this world. And that when eternity comes, these things are folded away. And so the apostle is saying, it mustn't take precedence over matters that are not temporary. 
It mustn't take precedence over relationships that should be established for eternity because the world and its passions pass away. How quickly circumstances change. How quickly family circumstances change. I'm not being morbid. I'm just being realistic, balanced, I hope biblical. It's saying to us, don't invest everything you have in the relationships of this world good, precious as they are, important as they obviously are. But remember, there are other relationships which we must take time to establish, which we must be careful to nurture, for they are not temporary and they are not passing. You hear a phrase at times, when somebody has passed away, he lived for his family or she lived for her family. Well, there's much in that that's commendable. But as it says here, the time is short. Don't live only, primarily, principally for the things of this world. Earthly relationships, important of course as they are, pale into insignificance when we think of heavenly relationships. Is the Lord your Father in heaven? Do you have a Father in heaven? Our natural ties to fathers and mothers in this world, precious as they are, they are temporary. And they are loosed sooner or later. But what is a Christian, someone who has a relationship with a father in heaven that will never be broken? Who can separate you from his love and from his grace? Nothing and no one. Is Christ your elder brother? Maybe you had a brother and the brother is gone. The brother has sadly died, maybe older, in some cases younger. But do you have a brother settled in heaven, an elder brother whose care and love for his family is so great and so glorious and so complete, who loved his own to the end, who gave himself for them, and whoever lives as their advocate and as a representative in heaven. The time is short. Oh, make sure that you use it to invest in these heavenly relationships so that when it comes to the end, you will have a father into his hands you can commit your spirit. You will have an elder brother who is ready and waiting to receive you. So that when it comes, you do not go into eternity unprepared, unready. It's talking here of husbands, wives. Are you part of that body of believers described in the Bible as the bride of Christ? Is he the bridegroom of your soul? Ah, we are to set our affections on things above for this world and its passions pass away so he applies it to our relationships but then you notice in the context he also applies it to our troubles verse 30 they that weep as though they wept not the apostle isn't being cruel he's not just saying to the people oh dry your tears and stop crying the Bible tells us, in fact, to weep with those who weep. But it's saying to us, 
not to be so overwhelmed by troubles that it takes over our lives to the exclusion of our spiritual needs. And you know, that can happen. Trouble can come, bereavement can come. Real disaster can come. And it can lead to bitterness, even in the heart of the Christian. It can lead to such sorrow that people never get over it and never get beyond it. And we've seen that happen. And it becomes a terrible spiritual stumbling block and a terrible spiritual barrier. Now, in the, in the context here, Paul is speaking in the first instance to Christians, but it applies to all of us. Ah, you say, I have so many troubles in my life, so many issues in my life, so many sorrows, so many worries. I can't even begin to think about spiritual things. Well, I'm not belittling your troubles, friend. You have every ounce of sympathy I can extend to you. But remember, this world and its fashions are passing away. And even these things are temporary. But there are other things that are eternal. He applies it to our relationships. He applies it to our troubles. Thirdly, he applies it to our pleasures. And you see this in verse 30 again. They that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not. Now, obviously, this is good. It's not weeping here. It's joy. But the apostle is saying, remember the same thing. Don't get so caught up with it that you forget that this world and its passions are passing away. Satan likes to keep us entertained. So that we think little or nothing of eternity and the needs of our souls. And there's never been as many distractions, I, I, I don't think. There's so many distractions. But remember, the apostle is saying, in the midst of pleasure, this is not a rest. Rejoice, O young man, says Solomon, the wisest of them all. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the ways of thy youth. But remember your creator in the days of your birth. Do not overlook the most important thing of all. So, he applies it to our relationships. He applies it to our troubles. He applies it to our pleasures. Fourthly, he applies it to our purchases. Verse 30. They that weep as though they wept not, they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not. The picture here is of people getting on and they're, they're buying things. And the apostle is saying, don't be so caught up with your purchases that you forget the most important things. Have you ever gone to the shop to get a couple of things and one thing was really important? The other things, well, they weren't so important. And off you go. And you remember all the other things. And the one thing you went for, you come home without, and you reach the house. And you say, oh, no. I forgot the one thing I went to for three for. I got all these other things, which I don't need. The one thing I can't do without, I forgot. And it's, it's too late. The shop's shut. Well, let's apply that to our spiritual situation. 
one thing is needful, says Jesus. Now, it's probably never been easier to have purchases. There's never been, been so much bought and sold. From gadgets to cars to property. And again, it's all legitimate. Of course it is. But even as we buy, don't set your heart on it. Don't think that if I could just get more purchases, I would find satisfaction. You know, there's something disappointing about it all, isn't there? Jesus says man's life, man's happiness does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And how true it is. You think we all do if I get, get a bigger car or a bigger house or a bigger whatever. I'll be, I'll be satisfied. This word will never satisfy your soul. There are spiritual longings and desires and needs there which always leave an empty spot. I, I, I've quoted Augustine so often, I'm, I'm reluctant to bring him up again. But he fits the bill so well. You know who I mean, that leader of the church in North Africa, he lived 1,500 years ago, brought up in a Christian home, or at least with a Christian mother. His father wasn't a believer, the mother was. He rebelled against all of that, he didn't want any of that. Went away, did very well for himself. He was an academic, of, he had an excellent mind, one of the brightest minds of, of that millennium, really. Climbed the ladder well. Went to the city and things are going very well. But all the time there is this longing in his soul, longing in his soul. When he tries this and he tries that, he tries the next thing. He can't get satisfaction. He's sitting in the garden one day, pretty depressed and discouraged. There's a child playing in the garden next door. And whatever the game the child was playing with the other child, it consisted of repeating over and over again the words, take up and read, take up and read, take up and read. This started to get into his head. Take up and read, take up and read, take up. His mother had given him a Bible. There were six inches of dust on it. Take up and read, take up. He took it up and he began reading it. And the change in Augustine's life was tracked to that afternoon. He became one of the most important figures in the church, not only in his own day, but down to our present. We owe so much to Augustine. And Augustine put it like this, and oh, he had drunk at the rivers of pleasure of this world. Humanly speaking, he had, he had a great deal. Thou hast made us for thyself, he says, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. God has made us for himself and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He applies it to our purchases. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The Bible says, whatever else you buy, buy the truth and don't sell it. As we saw just two weeks ago in Isaiah, let your soul, let your soul delight itself in fatness. And then verse 31, it sums it all up. They that use this world as not abusing it. What does that mean? Well, the world is abused. When instead of causing us to follow and to serve the Lord, it sends us in the opposite direction. It's abused when instead of being our servant, it becomes our master. The world has given us for our service. It was never meant to have the whip hand. 
but all too often the whip hand is what it has to the exclusion of all the rest. When it becomes our idol, when it becomes our God, when it becomes our everything, the world is abused. They that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. Two weeks ago, I quoted Horatius Bonar, a free church minister of long ago. And I came across something last week that he wrote on the word passing. And I'm going to leave you with it. The world, says Bonar, passes like a dream. You know what a dream is like? It's so real. You're there. You're doing it. You're waking up sometimes. And honestly, for the first few moments, you're, the dream is real. It's more real than, than, than what's around you. But suddenly it's morning. The world passes like a dream. The, wind, the, 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 the world then, says Bonner, passes like the mist of the morning. You know what it's like. You look out and there's a mist. And then you look and you see it no more. You can't embrace it. You can't keep it. It's here and it's gone. Will you embrace something so frail at the cost of eternity? The world passes like a dream. It passes like the mist of the morning. It passes thirdly like a shadow. It passes like a shadow. Now, there's nothing as unreal as a shadow, is there? Nothing as unreal as a shadow. With the sun just now, there's all sorts of shadows being cast, isn't there? The shadows in the window and all the rest of it. But the shadow has no substance. It doesn't last long. Are you chasing shadows? It's passing like the wave of the sea. Up it rises and it's gone. It's passing, says Bonor, like a rainbow, pretty but gone. I must conclude. I started with the Duke of Edinburgh. He attained high position. But the lowliest Christian, and I don't say this with any disrespect, to anybody, but the lowliest Christian has a far higher rank. It's not our relationship to the Queen that matters, but our relationship to the King, the King of Kings. It's not our relationship to this or that Prince that matters, but our relationship to Christ, the Prince of Glory. It's not our position in the Royal Court that matters, but our position in the court of heaven. Christian, apply this to yourself and I to myself. I would have you, verse 32, to be without carefulness. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And if it applies to the Christian, it applies ten times more to anyone who isn't. This world and its fashion is passing away. May God bless his word. Let's pray. Eternal and ever-blessed Lord, we pray thy blessing on us today that we would learn this lesson it's telling us something we know, but it's telling us something we forget, something we avoid, something we need to apply. It applies to our relationships, to our troubles, to our pleasures and to our purchases. Help us, Lord, to live in the light of it. Go before us now and pardon sin and be with us as we gather later. For Jesus' sake. Amen.
We're going to sing again in Psalm 103, from verse 13. Psalm 103, and at verse 13, we'll sing down to 17. I won't read the verses, I've quoted them already. Psalm 103 at 13, such pity as a father. Such pity. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and fellowship of God, the Holy Spirit, rest on and abide with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. Now, just a number of intimations uh, for you. 